everyone. I'm Rebecca Weber. This is your AMAC podcast, Better for America. And if you haven't yet done so, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you never miss another Better for America episode. Now, today I am so honored to have with us a gentleman named Seth Denson. This is a genuine problem solver, someone who looks hard at the world in which we live. He sees the risks at stake and he helps Americans make their way forward in the storm. Seth Denson is a successful analyst, a businessman, and a co founder of GDP Advisors and an author who recently penned a volume that is entitled The Cure, a a blueprint for solving America's healthcare crisis. And I say that if we ever needed hard-headed thinking in this area, it certainly is right now. Uh, Originally, Seth is from Texas. Uh, He advises Fortune 500 companies. He is a Newsmax contributor an opinion columnist, and has become a thoughtful voice nationally on topics from business and healthcare to recruiting and retention to faith and fatherhood. I welcome him to the show today. Seth Denson, thank you so much for being here with us. Rebecca, what a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. This is really great. And we have so much that we could speak about from the economy to crime, uh, global issues, local issues. And you have done such a great deal in so many areas. I do want to first begin, though, at the maybe at the center and sort of work outward, because you've written a book called The Cure, a blueprint for solving America's healthcare crisis. And as you probably know, many of America's seniors, especially AMAX over 2.3 million members, feel really cornered by poor health care policies, rising health care costs, um, cost of insulin, cost of prescription drugs. Let me ask you uh, a couple of questions here, because it's such a major issue for our members. In very broad terms, uh, what has gone wrong in our health care system, and how do we fix it? You know, my father was a man who always said, uh, America's got the greatest health care system in the world. And I remembered hearing that over and over when I was a young girl. Today, Things seem to look far different than they did. How do we keep quality up while getting costs down, especially right now? Can you offer some insights and tell us a little bit about your book? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, you know, I wrote the book uh, really is almost, a, 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 I got to say, I wrote the vast majority of it in one night, sitting down, listening to the debate going on of repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act with what was at the time the Republicans' uh, response to that. And I, and I sat there as somebody who is, has reviewed and studied and engaged in the healthcare sector uh, really for a big chunk of my career, I was ripping my hair out going, who are, t- who are advising these people? Uh, because quite frankly, none of it would work. The, the problem and the, the, the really big, we'll call it 10,000 foot view problem uh, with healthcare in the United States is the way in which it's financed. It's the way in which we access it, and that's through health insurance, right? Now, again, I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not saying I'm not an advocate of health insurance, but I am saying that I am against the way that health insurance is currently structured because it's not insurance at all. We think about insurance, we think about, well, it's protecting me from a risk. I'm transferring that risk. What our health insurance system has really become is a financier of that risk. They're financing it in really what I like to call the, the largest legal Ponzi in the United States uh, in, in a system that really does allow Americans to continuously take all of their money, pour it into this system, generate massive profits across the board. And what the Affordable Care Act did, unfortunately, was it exacerbated that. It provided a clear avenue, whereas when we've seen in the decade plus that's followed, Health insurance companies have gotten bigger. Uh, They've gobbled up smaller insurance companies. Their stock margin profits are are off the charts, as are larger healthcare systems. So we've actually consolidated access, which has actually increased the price. Now, your father was right. In a large part, the United States is responsible for the vast majority of medical innovation that is utilized throughout the world. The problem is, and this is where it kind of becomes a very entangled challenge, is that until we have an understanding that the federal government does need to be involved in our healthcare system, but not as a provider, rather as a referee, and structure globally that referee uh, basis, whereas our trade deals are dependent upon other countries paying their fair share and bringing down the overall cost of research and development that's on the back of the American taxpayer. Unfortunately, we as Americans are going to continue to subsidize the world. Those other countries have social 
socialized medicine and can because we don't. And until we get the government to really understand the business fundamentals of increased transparency, increased access where I have a clear understanding without the ambiguity of insurance when I go engage in the system, health insurance should work like auto insurance. It should work where if I go in, it's covered based on me paying for the premium, not based on me going somewhere that just happened to be in network. And now I don't understand all those costs. So these are the things I wrote the book really as a blueprint for solving America's healthcare crisis. I subtitled it. And, and I said, if, if Washington was really serious, here are 10 basic steps that they could do really to move the ball forward. Unfortunately, the healthcare lobby encompassed of the health insurance, pharmaceutical, uh, which I like to call the legal drug cartel of the United States, uh, and, and all of that is the largest single lobby in Washington. So unfortunately, getting our politicians on either side of the party, on either side of the political aisle, to really engage in things that could work, well, I can hope in one hand and spit in the other, uh, as we say in Texas. But uh, unfortunately, I'm a hopeful guy. I'm going to keep doing it, but we're going to keep talking about it, too, and hopefully somebody will listen. Well, Seth, thank you. We do want to uh, certainly let people get to that book. We'll put a link right here. Uh, the Cure, a, blue, a Blueprint for Solving America's Healthcare Crisis. And you are absolutely right. Um, there's also such a lack of transparency. You know, when you buy your car insurance, if you have an automobile loss, you bring your car to a preferred perhaps your local uh, mechanic or auto body uh, repairman, uh, and you'll get various estimates. You know what you're paying. Uh, you know what you're paying for your insurance, and you know what you're paying uh, when, when that insurance kicks in, and you've got maybe some out-of-pocket expenses, which we call a deductible in the insurance world, right? Uh, but when it comes to your health insurance, it, it does seem that not only uh, are costs out of control but Americans are at a loss of transparency. They don't know what they're paying for. And simple surgeries that could be performed at a fraction of the cost uh, by certain doctors uh, may, may not be sought out because they don't realize that there's a there's a cheaper price and, and there's no incentive, you know, people are not incentivized to do that, to really, to really shop for competition, which we know competition drives down costs. So uh, you've made so many really good points. I have not yet read the book, but I, I'm excited to get my hands on it. It is very important to our over 2 million members. Uh, and, you know, this is an issue that's not going to go away. We're going to hear more about healthcare in the future, I know. So uh, we really appreciate these great insights. Thank you for that. Uh, another issue that seems to cross-cut healthcare uh, is right now is inflation. Now, you're a businessman, you're a policy analyst, and you carefully track both the macro and micro economic trends. So I do want to ask you, why do you think we're suffering from runaway inflation? Now, before you answer, uh, we've all witnessed uh, really an unprecedented cut in fossil fuel production in the United States. We know that that's driven by Biden's really anti-oil and anti-gas policies. Uh, and we heard Mr. President Joe Biden just say that uh, it's not massive federal spending that's causing inflation. Um, what are your thoughts there? What is driving this inflation? And how do we really, in the future, in the months ahead, in the years ahead, get, get inflation under control? Well, I, I, I'm glad you recognize the time horizon that it will likely take to get inflation under control, and that's the sad state we're in. So I would tell your, your listeners that they just need to be prepared. That this isn't something that we're going to flip a switch and change. Um, I disagree with what the president said in that uh, deficit spending, specifically the more than six plus trillion that we spend over really an 18 month period, in addition to our deficit spending to, to offset COVID challenges that quite frankly, in my opinion, were very unnecessary. Uh, that's what started and exacerbated the problem, coupling that with the fact that the federal government in large part shut off a global economy. We shut off it here and then the rest of the world kind of followed suit. Um, and, and, and so that's really the problem. You have what's called the whiplash effect. So this is a combo issue of what we call supply chain challenges coupled with too much money in the system. Too many dollars chasing too few things. That is the simplest uh, definition of inflation that there is out there. And, and so what's happened is, when the federal government under their COVID relief program came in and said, hey, let's shut it off. We all remember 15 days to slow the spread, which became 15 months plus. Um, you know, what that did is it shut down the overall economic engine. Well, what happens when the federal government continues to print money, thinking that, that was going to tide people over? Well, I like to say in a very simplistic way that we would say here in Texas, you flooded the engine. You pumped the gas without cranking it. And when you went to crank it, it didn't work. Uh, and
And that's effectively what happened. We expected the economy to just turn back on. And it's like a 1995 Windows version computer. Uh, you could shut it off real quick, but turn it back on. That's going to take some time for that processor to get going. And that's the reality of things. We've started to catch up with that. The challenge that we now have coupled with it is energy policy. And fuel is in everything we do, right? Whether it goes into the goods that we buy or it transports those goods from the factory on. And so as we start to think about two key things that can help solve our inflationary problem today. It's energy policy and monetary policy. Now the Fed played politics for way too long. We used words like transitory, which those of us in the business and economic world went, what are they even talking about? You have people like Janet Yellen out uh, just recently saying, well, we didn't see it coming. That's your job. It's your job to see that coming. And if you can't do your job, I, I don't think Janet Yellen is ignorant. I think she's a very intelligent person. So she either she's past her prime and can no longer do this because she's lost her edge or she's lying. And I tend to think it's probably the latter. They did see it coming. They just knew politically they couldn't say that. Um, and so when you've got those challenges, you've got to start where you can. You've got to reduce deficit spending. That means everybody's got to start tightening their belt. That's not fun, especially in political season, which it seems like we're never out of. Politicians don't get reelected by not spending money. Uh, and so they want to try to do that. And then you've got to have a better energy policy. Us relying on OPEC and foreign, what I would call adversaries, to supply us with energy when we could be a net exporter. But here's the reality. If you think about in the energy producers here in the United States, and it's easy for us to demonize these folks, certainly the, the, the mainstream media loves to do it, and that's because it's backed by environmental policies that are well, quite, yeah, I won't go there, but they're not good, right? They don't, they're, they're and meant they're, to distract these, us, really. That's it's exactly meant to distract right. us, quite frankly, yeah. So when you've got these energy, if you look at the S&P 500 over the last really five years, the S&P 500 is up over 70%. If you look at four of the top five major oil producers, they're averaging about a 12 to 15% uh, increase in, in margin and share price. So the S&P has done extremely well while oil producers are doing well right now. But even some like British Petroleum, for example, they're still in a deficit over the last five years. If you were a stockholder of BP, you're still down over the last five years. Shell Corporation, less than less than 10 percent. Uh, Exxon, just around 22 percent. So you start to think about this. The problem was it wasn't that long ago. We had below zero dollar a barrel oil. Well, the federal government wasn't there at that time right? Uh, they were saying they can handle it. Well, now we're asking these same manufacturers to mass produce with an administration who has made it very clear that they want to be an enemy, uh, that they do not want to support these folks. We could be a net exporter. It could drive more economic value and, in my opinion, increase our economic secure, our national security. But unfortunately, until the Biden administration will sit down with these energy producers and convey to them a message they know that they're going to be there for them, I don't think we're going to get there. And, and I'll say this one last thing. The Biden administration has started uh, releasing a million barrels a day uh, out of the strategic oil reserve, and which is, by the way, a blip on, on the total usage that we use, 20, 20 million barrels a day. Uh, but that being said, the Keystone Pipeline, about a million barrels a day. So we shut that down uh, when that could have been that onset. And so this is just an exacerbated challenge. Until we, Oil will be the key to getting inflation under control because it's not likely we're going to change monetary policy. So we need to better our energy policy. Thank you, Seth. Really such a sobering assessment. And I think that all eyes are really on the economy. I do want to pivot a bit and see if you might help us, especially coming from Texas near the border and seeing these, I, I'm seeing so many trends tied together. Really, it's um, so I, I want, want to ask for you to offer your analysis on the link, linkage between what we see happening in the economy, also high crime, and the administration's open border policies and their fight for this, you know, gun control, uh, really to a layperson, I think uh, they see a link between those things. Uh, and many Americans are insecure about the economy and public safety. And even this morning, my goodness, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh had an attempted assassination on him for supporting our Second Amendment. Unbelievable. Do you think that these events are tied together by a sense that somehow the priorities of the American people, which would be, we hope that the priorities are self-protection, jobs, wages and growth, right, affordable energy and rule of law, 
that those things that are important to most Americans are clearly not a priority for this administration, because that's what it seems to the average layperson and to our members and listeners. It seems very clear that we have an American president who doesn't care much about uh, rule of law and certainly not about affordable energy, uh, but pushes for things like more gun control, does not address what we're seeing uh, on the streets with rising crime. Uh, and then what we see happening to our Supreme Court justice, it's, it's um, something's got to give here. <laughs> why, why do you think this is not a priority for this administration? Well, I, I think it's not a priority because it doesn't, it, they're based, to, it's not to their far left base. I think to most Democrats, it is a priority, right? I, I really do. And I've got friends on both sides of the aisle. And as I talk to people, they certainly want to make sure that when they go drop their kids off at school, they're going to be safe. No parent should ever have to be concerned with that. They want to know that when they go to the store, they don't have to worry about getting mugged when they walk out of it, uh, that their house is going to be safe at night. When they call the police, somebody's going to respond and they're going to be taken care of. These are all concerns, I think, to everyday Americans. Americans. But I think that the challenge that this administration has put itself in is they have kowtowed to that far side that says it's inhumane to have law and justice. Uh, and, and, and I don't know where that disconnect ever came from. I think it's inhumane not to. Um, and, and when you look at places like San Francisco, I was glad to see that their DA has just been recalled. When you've got leaders, elected leaders in these very what we'll call sanctuary-based cities, and I'd say sanctuary from everything from you know illegal aliens to crime crime uh, that say, hey, we're not going to prosecute. There's no, there's, you know, there's no, there's no self-responsibility. There's no, ju you know, justice given to, to the actions. Um, well, that's just inviting crime. When you couple that uh, with an open border policy, you know, Texas is one of the only states that actually tracks crime of illegal aliens for public consumption. So it's really hard to compare apples to apples across the country on that. Um, but certainly we see it here. And you couple that with uh, the economic challenges. Whenever you do see recession, you see a ec potential economic downturns, crime tends to rise. The statistics show that. So all of these things in alignment with one another create massive challenges. And I think that this administration has chosen to try to deflect as opposed to engage. And, and unfortunately, the policies, and they don't want to have to walk any of them back, they feel like their policies are inhumane when they engage in uh, law and order, uh, as opposed to the opposite. And the reality is, as I mentioned a minute ago, I think it is the opposite. I think it's inhumane not to engage in those things. Yeah, I so agree with you there. It does seem very backwards. I've been saying that for, for a long while now, that um, just so much that, that should be going one way is going the other, and it just doesn't make a lot of common sense to me. I do want to ask you as a businessman, and someone really, you advise large corporations and large employers, and these are people who essentially innovate and really help grow our economy with more jobs in the private sector. Um, do those people that you meet with, consult with, uh, do, do they, do you think that we are headed for a recession? Because I did read an article this week that America's life savings fell uh, to its lowest point in 14 years. Uh, so this is just people's accumulated wealth is falling. And because prices have increased so much on everyday goods, I know that there's a huge uh, percentages of people that are now living paycheck to paycheck. I think it's over 60%. Uh, do you have any any? broad advice for those who are hoping to protect their life savings and afford uh, food and energy? And do you think that we are headed, you know, for the Jimmy Carter days again? With well, double digit I think inflation. In many ways there, unfortunately. And, you know, I think it's hard to say stagflation. Um, you know, I think that this one's going to, the, the difference I think in this one is it's going to be, it's not a broad, uh, maybe more of a, a nationwide economic challenge as much as in certain pockets. Um, I do think in places like Texas and Florida and some of these other states that have had a different political approach to the economy, uh, I think that they're going to be better suited in large part because many corporations and many people moved into these states uh, during the last couple of years to get away from, we'll call it the, the chokehold that, that state and local governments tended to try to have on them and, and, and the tax policies. So I think that here, while you may see housing bubbles burst, I don't think you're going to see that as much in places like Texas and Florida. Um, because there's going to be more economic activity in those places, I think that those places will do better. But, you know, certainly we are going to see stagflation in certain places, I think. And, and, and as far as a recession goes, I, you know, it's interesting. I made this comment the other day on air um, when doing, they, they asked a, a very similar question. 
in retrospect, you know, in thinking about what like Jamie Dimon came out and said, we're headed towards a hurricane, and Elon Musk said things are going to get super bad, which, by the way, I think is a technical term now in the economic world. Um, but what what if if you've got people in the business world saying, hey, it's raining, so effectively let's think of them like weatherman, and you have somebody with no weather experience saying, no, it's perfectly sunny. I think I probably tend to go with the people, the meteorologists, those people that study it. Um, same thing goes in business. The Biden administration, I can't tell you who's got business um, business experience that is advising this president. I, I, I don't know who they are. Um, I mean, even Janet Yellen, who is a very intelligent person and has a great economic book study um, experience, I don't know that Janet Yellen's ever run a business. Uh, and until you've run a business and put yourself in a position of managing a PL, generating revenue, understanding where that revenue might need to go, you're going to have a hard time really doing that. So I think as we start to look at this, there will be certain states that see higher levels of stagflation. That's where the economy stops growing, but inflation continues at a high level. Um, what we're going to see in some states, I think that the economy will continue to grow. States like Texas and Florida and some of these others that I mentioned, that's going to stave off stagflation in those areas. As for the everyday Americans, it's, it's you know if you haven't already, it's time to start thinking your time horizon. If you're invested in the market, you need to be making sure you're working with an advisor that understands what your time horizon was and has you set up appropriately. I tell people all the time, if your time horizon is a long one and you're looking at the stock market, well, listen, you need to look at this as opportunity because stocks might be on sale. Stay on that roller coaster. Don't jump off in the middle of the ride. and You're probably going to be just fine. But if your time horizon is shorter and you're going, hey, listen, I have X amount of time that I need to make my money last and that's, that time period is shorter, well, you may have to make some more difficult decisions about what you do with that time. We're all trading time for dollars. Uh, and what I tell people a lot is we, we, you, there's this old saying, right, don't miss the forest for the trees. Don't miss the tree for the forest. Uh, if your time horizon is shorter, you need to look at what are those singular things that you might be able to do today that help your money go further. Maybe it's that losing that subscription service. Maybe it's changing that vacation plan. Uh, maybe it's doing some of those things. But unfortunately, I think that for the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to continue to see our economy struggle uh, and the markets are going to continue to struggle as well. Seth, thank you so much. I have a couple of more quick questions for you. I know your time is so valuable. I want to shift to talk a little bit about our changing American culture, uh, because it really does seem like a different world. And you're a voice of reason, but you're also a man of conscience and faith. And you're a father and someone who obviously is concerned, as our members are also concerned, uh, in really restoring and preserving and protecting the, the heritage and the values of this nation. Uh, I'm a mother myself and as a businesswoman and a patriot, uh, I'm a daughter of a veteran. I wonder as I look around at the culture that we're creating for our children, uh, from federal dependence to normalizing hysteria, we're de-emphasizing personal accountability and responsibility. It's just so concerning. Um, so I ask you, how do you think we can get out of this? Where will the leaders uh, come? W where will leadership come from? Uh, and how will we restore what we know to uh, really be accurate history and respect and forward movement? Um, just last week, Joe Biden gave a speech boasting, you know, that since he took office, you know, American families are carrying less debt and feel more financially comfortable. But I don't know that that's true. This is clearly a, a blatant lie in my view. And I wonder how we can really return to what Ronald Reagan always said uh, was America's destiny, really a, a future brighter for each generation. How do we get there? Well, listen, uh, he, there's a lot to unpack there. And of course, you know, my faith drives me, but I recognize that it doesn't drive everybody else. And I certainly would never put my faith on others, but I'll pray for them. Uh, and I'll try to spend more time on my knees than I do inside of an echo chamber. Uh, and I think that we've got to get out of that echo chamber every once in a while. We've, we've lost the value of listening in this country, uh, of really listening and hearing what the other side is saying. It's easy for us to try to stay in our echo chamber uh, because there's comfort there. But we don't always understand what the other side is saying, uh, and that's on both sides of the aisle. We've lost a sense of, of, of civics in our country. Uh, and, and quite frankly, they're not taught in our schools the way they should be. It's one way or the other way. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the other way, which tends to be my way, is rarely taught in schools these days anymore. Um, and, and so that's, that's really challenging. And then we've lost personal responsibility. I mean, just recently, the president was out talking about eliminating college debt. 
Um, well, that means you're telling people that never went to college they got to pay for people that did, or people that maybe spent a lot of years paying off their college debt that, well, you were just too late to the party. Um, there's no personal responsibility, and, and this reliance on the federal government to solve all of our problems. COVID's a perfect example of that. We should have let the free markets work during COVID. We didn't. Why? Politics. And by the way, Republicans were just as guilty of that. We did not want political reasons to get in the way of capitalism, and they didn't or vice versa. And so what happened was we spent and we spent and we spent. And we said, the federal government's got you, even if you didn't need it. By the way, we paid people stimulus checks without an economy to stimulate that never lost their job. I mean, so when you think about the idiocracy there, it is we have continuously told this generation and the generation of my children, hey, you don't have to worry. There's always somebody else there to get that you can pass the buck to, that they're going to be there to take care of you. And unfortunately, while I love that we have a country that can, we don't always have to in the way that we do it. Um, and, and as a result, we've lost this sense of self-responsibility and, and, and we've lost this ability to understand that nobody gets a participation trophy in life right? You win or you lose. And when you lose, you try to learn from that and you pick back up. We want to help those that can't help themselves, but at the same time, those that can, they need to. And then we need to get back to a place where there's just not always this safety net, this participation trophy, and quite frankly, feelings. We got to get over this feelings for everything. Uh, it's tough. I get it. But life is. And as we as a country want to be that shining city on the hill that Reagan talked about, um, unfortunately, we need to get back to those principles of civility, listening, and personal responsibility. And I love that you do a reference to your faith. Uh, faith here at AMAC is so important. You know, we were built on really believing in the strong values of our faith, family, and freedom. Uh, a freedom of religion, uh, valuing life, sanctity of, of life, and all of those things that are really rooted or come from our, our morals. And um, for me, uh, I get those morals fr through my faith. Uh, and I think that um, our members agree that this country, we need a lot of healing. We need a lot of prayer. Uh, I pray that the Holy Spirit shows up and, and um does work that no human can do because there is so much work that needs to be done. Uh, but I, I pray especially for families. I pray for families, for mothers and fathers, for children, uh, because that is where so much of this comes from. If you've got a good family unit and you've got that stability and that security of love, uh, and if, if on top of that, you're, you're told and reminded that you have a beautiful creator, a wonderful, all-powerful God who... Um, has wonderful plans for you, plans for you to prosper, and that's supported with encouragement and people who encourage. This nation could be so much greater, uh, and pe the people of this nation so much um, happier. And that's what we want. Uh, we really just we pray for all people. So I really appreciate that you share share with us the importance of faith in your life. You have done so much, and I, I just so appreciate your reflections, and I know our members do too. Uh, I have one last question for you, Seth. What do you think will happen in the next election? Uh, and what do you think is really going to drive people to the polls, um, the big issues? And, uh, uh, you know, how do you think we'll look after November 2022? Uh, well, if you ask me to take a snapshot, and I try not to be too much of a weatherman on this either, but if you ask me to take a snapshot today, I, I don't see a path where the Republicans don't take back control of the House of Representatives and likely the control of the Senate. I, I just I do see that as... as is kind of the, the the next phase after this election cycle. Um, what Republicans need to do, and again, I don't advise any Republicans on their policy, but I would tell them to stay away from feeling issues and stay back to factor issues, right? Um, we've got a lot of different varying issues on everything from guns to abortion, and certainly these are debates that need to be had and positions that need to be taken. But the reality is, as it's been said so well so many years, it is the economy, stupid, uh, and that's really going to drive things. And, and if Republicans can stay on point, they'll probably do just fine. We do need to get back to the economy, stupid. That is the reality uh, of the situation that we're in. And certainly I have a very moral approach and, and, and things that drive me from a faith base on those other issues that I want to make sure that I can scream from the mountaintops when I need to. But you don't get to scream much if you're not in power. So when, uh, and you can do that. And I think that we see a very different landscape. The challenge that we're going to have, at least until the 2024 election, is you will have divided government. And so if they can come to find a way to work together to move the ball forward, great. The primary systems that we have, though, and the fact that everything is recorded and 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 
there for public consumption whenever the echo chamber wants it on either side, keeps people from really working together. And I think we've got to get past that. We need our leaders to kind of lay down their arms every once in a while and say, we're willing to work together without the fear of I'm going to get primary just because I worked with the other side. Uh, and until then, I don't think we move the ball forward all that much. But you know what? That pendulum, I don't think our founders wanted it to swing all that wide very fast. They liked split government. They liked the fact that things move slow. Uh, and so I think that after this next election cycle, we're going to see it. 2024, a little far out. We'll see who ends up running. Uh, but things could look very different over the next few years. There is so much to be hopeful for. There really is. And I know that our listeners, our members, uh, are some of the greatest patriots here in America. And just uh, having the conversations, getting, you know, removing the rhetoric and really going back to basic common sense and goodness. And uh, I believe, I'm, I'm an optimist, I believe that, um, you know, goodness always wins out over evil. So uh, we'll continue our prayers. Seth, it has been just a wonderful uh, opportunity to have this sit down with you. I thank you so much for your truthful insights, uh, your civic commitment, as well as for your thought leadership. Your book is out. It's very uh, valuable and available, entitled The Cure, a blueprint for solving America's healthcare crisis. Thank you so much for your optimism. It was great to have you here today. Thanks for all you're doing. Appreciate you having me on. Oh, thank you. And I want to thank all of you AMAC members out there, all of our listeners. Thank you for tuning in today. Go ahead and download that AMAC News app so that you can watch and listen to this podcast and track breaking news right there from your phone. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, follow, like, and share wherever you are on social media. Until next time, I'm Rebecca Weber. This is your podcast, Better for America. Thank you for being here. Have a great day, everyone. You're listening to the Better for America podcast presented by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. To learn more about AMAC and all it has to offer, visit us at www.amac.us.